Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for the Creating Your Decarbonization Plan webinar. This is the second in our winter webinar series with Drive Clean Indiana and Wisconsin Clean Cities, and we're thrilled to have you with us today. Next slide, please. I'm Lori Cagle. I am the Communications Director for both Drive Clean Indiana and Wisconsin Clean Cities, and I will be your moderator today. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a wonderful group of panelists who are going to be joining us today in just a short while, uh, including Evelyn Bauman, who is the Director of Sustainability for the City of South Bend, Mahanth Joyshi, the Superintendent for City of Madison Fleet Service, Stephen Holcomb, Manager of Environmental Policy and Sustainability for NYSORS, and Maria Redmond, Director of the Wisconsin Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy. Next slide, please. First, I'd like to tell you uh, very briefly about Drive Clean Indiana and Wisconsin Clean Cities. And I should also mention that some of you uh, may know Drive Clean Indiana by our former name, South Shore Clean Cities. Uh, we recently renamed and rebranded as part of our expansion uh, by the Department of Energy to a statewide Clean Cities Coalition. Uh, so the Clean Cities Coalitions, these are two of the U.S. Department of Energy's more than 75 Clean Cities Coalitions. All of the Clean Cities Coalitions, including these two, support the nation's economic and energy security by building partnerships to advance affordable domestic transportation fuels, energy efficient mobility systems, and other fuel saving technologies and practices. Next slide, please. Uh, both Drive Clean Indiana and Wisconsin Clean Cities are member-based organizations, and I'd mentioned that we are statewide. Uh, we're also nonprofit organizations. Uh, the individual work by the two uh, coalitions support the advancement of alternative fuels, alternative fuel vehicles, sustainable vehicle technologies, uh, such as electric vehicles and their charging and fueling infrastructures. Uh, the efforts of both of the coalitions help to reduce the nation's dependence on imported oil, improve air quality, support local jobs, drive economic development, and improve promote, rather, improved quality of life. Next slide, please. We are going to get right into our panel discussion now, so I would like to invite Evelyn Bauman, Mahanth Joyshi, Stephen Holcomb, and Maria Redmond to turn your cameras and mics on, please. Great, thank you so much. Thank you all again for joining us. Uh, we will take questions from attendees if we have any, so please feel free to type them into the chat and we'll try to get to as many as possible after the panelists have completed with our discussion. Uh, we're gonna start uh, by having the panelists tell us very briefly a little bit about yourselves and your organizations. Uh, Maria, let's start with you. Sure, thank you so much everyone for joining today. My name is Maria Redmond, Director of the Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy for the state of Wisconsin. The office was created in 2019 via Executive Order 38 with the intention of helping the state to address climate change through uh, uh, transition of energy and sustainability efforts uh, and creating programs and, and projects to do so. And so over the last couple of years, uh, I've helped the uh, Governor's Task Force on Climate Change get to a list of recommendations. I've been working on a clean energy plan for the state, um, hence the reason I'm here to kind of share some of the, the thoughts and ideas as it relates to that, and really just um, looking at the ways that we can reduce our uh, carbon footprint and, and decarbonize um, multiple sectors here in Wisconsin to help improve the environment and health of our, of our residents here. Doing great work. We appreciate having you as a partner, Maria. Uh, Stephen, tell us a little bit about your work in decarbonization with NYSORS. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Stephen Holcomb, and I serve as Manager Environmental Policy and Sustainability for NYSORS. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, uh, NYSORS serves nearly 4 million electric and natural gas customers across six states um, with the Columbia Gas and NIPSCO names. Um, I've worked for our company in Indiana for about a decade, and I'm really excited about our decarbonization plan um, in which we're targeting a 90% reduction in our in the greenhouse gas emissions from our operations by 2030. Um, that's from a 2005 baseline. 
And what's really exciting is that we are actively implementing this plan uh, to reach our target. And we're about uh, at a 60% reduction already. Um, and that's through a transition uh, from coal-fired electric generation to, cl to cleaner sources and a reduction in methane emissions from uh, pipe replacement and uh, leak detection and repair. Um, and we're doing this sustainably uh, with a focus on serving customers in a safe, uh, reliable, and affordable way. Um, there's also opportunities to help customers reduce their emissions, um, both in, on the electric and gas side. Uh, we call our customer-focused strategy, uh, Your Energy, Your Future, and it includes several uh, work streams, including one on transportation decarbonization, uh, that should enable us to set deeper emission reduction targets and uh, and enable a just tr energy transition. Um, so that's our decarbonization plan in a nutshell. You guys are doing great work. We appreciate having you as a partner, Stephen. Uh, Evie, can you share what the CS South Bend is doing in this capacity, please? Sure. Thank you, Lori. My name is Evie Bellman, and I'm the Director of Sustainability for the City of South Bend. And our office sits within the Department of Community Investment. So we are really interested in helping the community move along on our journey to become carbon neutral by 2050. So back in 2019, our city passed a community-wide climate action plan that stated our goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2050. So we're really focused right now on reducing emissions from energy and transportation and switching to cleaner fuel sources in both of those areas. So we recently launched a grant program for nonprofits, for example, to help them undergo energy efficiency upgrades and pursue solar, receive a free energy assessment. So uh, programs like that is what we're interested in really helping the community get on board with reaching the goals set out in our climate action plan. That's terrific. We're so proud of uh, all the work that's taking place there and uh, love having you guys as a partner. And uh, finally, Mahant, last but not least, how is the city of Madison working on decarbonization? Thank you very much, Lori. So um, the fleet department is in charge of 1,400 vehicles uh, that we uh, maintain and purchase uh, on behalf of the city of Madison. And that's um, everything you uh, would see in a typical city fleet, police cars and fire trucks and garbage trucks. Plow trucks, which are out today over here and maybe in some of your communities as well. Um, so we, our strategy has been uh, two main kind of prongs. One is electrification. We're up to um, 70 electric vehicles now. We have uh, the nation's only operating electric fire truck uh, at station eight here. It's been active since May 2021 20, and it's working great. Uh, we're hoping to get a lot more electric cars and trucks. Uh, and then on the heavy duty side, our bigger solution has been biodiesel. So we are operating blends of uh, either B5 or B20, depending on the season. Um, that's 20% biodiesel is B20. We're trying to get to B100 with a new technology from a company called Optimus that we've just installed. So I'm looking forward to having 17 vehicles operating on B100 year round. That's 100% biodiesel all 12 months of the year. Um, and if that pilot is successful, we're doing this year with those 17 vehicles. I'm hoping to expand it to everything that's diesel. So our high level strategy for getting rid of a lot of carbon, we've gotten rid of 8 million pounds so far since 2018, but we have a long way to go. Uh, hopefully by 2030, everything we have will be electric or 100% biodiesel. That's our strategy. I'm confident we'll get there. Uh, we aggressively have to replace a lot of, um, a lot of cars, vans, pickup trucks, uh, things like that. On the light and medium duty side, I think we're good. I think the gasoline engine is dying um, and we want to help kill it. Um, and I think that's going to take a few more years. As we look at the pickup trucks coming out this year, I'm very excited, as some of you might be, about the F-150 Lightning and the Tesla Cybertruck and some other medium duty options for us on the electric side. Great. Well, lots of exciting things taking place, uh, not only in Madison, but really with all of these, uh, all the communities and organizations and offices that are represented here. So we really are fortunate to have experts and champions joining us today. Uh, so as we get ready to talk about decarbonization, I think that that term may be a bit of a mystery to some folks and that some may even have different ideas of what it means or different organizations may have uh, different uh, definitions of what that means. So can you give us a 10,000 foot explanation of what it is and how it's defined? Maybe we should start with Maria on this one. Sure, so um, carbon is 
of part of life. So when we talk about decarbonization, we're not talking about, you know, just eliminating it altogether. Um, carbon is a necessary uh, element as part of um, the, there's a carbon cycle. And so I'd say maybe millions of years ago, thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, um, there was a really good balance of the carbon cycle. And so it was a neutral. Um, so the carbon going, coming out of us breathing and our different processes um, was balanced by carbon sequestration in our forests and our you know land and so as as humans started to advance um and started to move around differently we got the internal combustion engine we became more dependent on energy uh and burning coal um that we dropped the balance of of carbon in the atmosphere and as a result of that we have uh, for years and years and years of that building up in the atmosphere um, and in our air, we have seen catastrophic change uh, related to, to that. And often we talk about it in the form of climate change and that it's changed the cycle of life and changed our environment. And, and so with, with that, there's been you know, really tremendous weather events, um, like tremendously tragic weather events, um, even within our, the Midwest in the last year, like we are surprised by tornadoes you know, in the winter or, or you know flooding and things like that and so that has a huge effect on our economy on the health of our, our residents that live in our states um and, and you, we can i could continue to go on and on about it but what we have to do is we have to solve this problem of of, of too much carbon um and too many greenhouse gas emissions and so to do that, um, we have all recognized that we have to take action. And a lot of states um, and, and a lot of communities here, as you see here, a lot of businesses are, are taking steps to decarbonize and saying, what can I do and what can we do to work together and create uh, opportunities to change the way that we consume our energy, be more efficient, um, deploy cleaner energy that doesn't emit so much, um, and then also sequester carbon. Um, that's in the atmosphere and you know plant, like pay attention to our forests and pay attention to our ag land and so when we talk about decarbonization it's really working towards creating that that getting back to that that neutral cycle so that everybody can and be healthy and have the benefits of of, of the way it's supposed to be when it um, and kind of take back all the stuff that we've done as humans to cause a lot of problems Sure. Does anybody's organization have any different ways in which they in which they define? It was a great explanation, Maria. Right. We have great consensus. That's good. <laughs> or, or I can add. Um, sure. I can go add, ahead. When, we, when we discuss decarbonization, we often or you might hear about uh, scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. And just for the the audience, just a high level, what that 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 is. Um, scope one emissions are defined by your direct greenhouse gas emissions that, that come from sources that are controlled and owned by your company or organization. So for example, that's that's our power plant, plants, that's Mahant's uh, fleet. Um, uh, scope two emissions are indirect greenhouse gas emissions associated with energy use, um, such as electricity that produces emissions at a power plant, um, but result from your own building's energy use. Um, so that that's uh, so EV's uh, electric usage in the room that she's in. Um, there's no direct emissions from that electricity in the room she's in, um, but those emissions are produced remotely at a utility power plant, um, or or at a uh, zero emission source uh, remotely, <laughs> where there might not be any emissions. Um, scope three emissions, lastly, are emissions associated with your value chain, uh, both upstream and downstream. Um, and you can include several things in there too, like business travel. So um, just wanted to provide those definitions for folks that may have come across them or might use them regularly. That's perfect, appreciate that. So, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, uh, Laurie, just something I would add is, um, I know that um, I mentioned that I work in fleet, but facilities that fleets operate in are also an important piece of the carbon puzzle. So. In our case, we've invested a lot in solar technology, for example, uh, to reduce our carbon footprint, not just the vehicles, but the, the housing for the vehicles or where we uh, park the vehicles, plug them in, 
repair them, which is a lot of our space and can be very carbon intensive for a lot of auto operations. So you really need to think about your HVAC systems, your power systems, and if you can add alternative energy to offset carbon and not just your tailpipe emissions. It's great, great example of that. I've been in that facility and it, it's fantastic. Uh, I'm curious, now that we have it kind of defined and have talked a little bit about what we're all doing in our own arenas, uh, curious about how all of you got started with your own decarbonization plans. Uh, Stephen, let's start with you and how NYSource uh, first got started. Yeah, th thanks, Lori. Um, I think most decarbonization plans start with uh, measurement and, and accounting for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as you might imagine, it's pretty difficult to formulate a decarbonization plan without um, knowing how, how many or estimating the emissions that, that you're emitting already. Um, and I think there's numerous resources available to assist in accounting for greenhouse gas emissions, including protocols, um, EPA or agency reports and websites, and um, uh, your local Clean Cities Coalition can, can help with that too. <laughs> but it, in, in summary, uh, our, our greenhouse gas accounting began around 2005, which is a pretty common baseline for emission reduction targets. Um, and subsequent to that, we developed a board level uh, climate change policy around 2009, uh, which established and aligned our company around our commitments related to emission reductions. Um, and I'll also mention it's really helpful not only to have leadership support for a decarbonization plan, but also a, uh, a cross-functional management team. Um, decarbonization impacts a lot of areas in a company, um, operations, customers, workforce, um, finance, uh, to name a few. Um, so really a committed core team uh, can provide support, gather data, and analyze all the risks and opportunities associated with a decarbonization plan. Um, and so we have a pretty good team here at NYSource um, that uh, has helped to get, put together our decarbonization plan. Great, how about the others? How did you get started? Um, I can chime in. Uh, the I had mentioned that there was an executive order uh, 38 that uh, charged and created this office to start working on a decarbonization plan, specifically the clean energy plan, and also ask state agencies to to look at um, ways to reduce their emissions and um, you know look at standards related to buildings and things like that. Um, similar to, to Stephen, um, having a champion is, is helpful. We have the governor as a champion um, telling us like, hey, we, we really need to, to look at this and figure this out. And so as part of the clean energy planning process, I would also agree that um, collaborative effort, um, the work that we do uh, and the effect of the work that we do um, impacts everyone in the state. And so we need to make sure that um, we have all the agency, agencies engaged, which we do, um, and then making sure that we listen and, and ensure that we're, we're hearing ideas and um, taking into consideration people who are gonna be impacted by any change. Um, and so I have a clearly, you know, a wide scope of things that I'm working on. We're working across multiple sectors, but with the transportation sector, as an example, there's a lot of interest in obviously electrification um, and, you know, where are those stations going to be located? Who's going to own those stations? Um, is it equally distributed? You know, is it going to go um, electric vehicle emissions and emissions in general tend to impact certain communities more than others. So are we making a concerted effort to think about environmental justice and racial justice um, in this in this process? And so making sure that everybody has a voice in the process and that you're hearing and taking into consideration all of that. So I think having a goal and a champion, we have 100% carbon-free electricity. I didn't mention that earlier, I felt bad. I'm like, oh, I should have said that. 100% carbon-free electricity consumed in the state by 2050. Um, but making sure that we understand the interdependencies of the different sectors, the impact that electrification will have on our power sector and our goals in that. So I think um, that's, you know, it's, it's a very, very collaborative, um, equitable um, effort. So that's, you know, that's kind of the values that we've been leaning on. Sure. Evie Mahanth, did you want to weigh in on this? Uh, yeah, I could uh, mention, you know, I'm very fortunate to have worked in New York City government operations, um, which I joined uh, 20 years ago now. And um, 
I work with New York City Parks, which already has kind of a green mission in everything they do. Uh, it's a very large park system. It was over 30,000 acres uh, that of green space the city took care of. So I think we kind of, all of us that were there kind of inculcated a sense of uh, environmentalism and uh, running the fleet for them. Uh, that's where I got my, kind of cut my teeth in decarbonization. Uh, and it's been a great 20 years, a lot of advancements made in industry since then, which is really exciting to see. I expect the next 20 years will be a lot more than what we saw in the last 20. Probably at a more rapid pace as well. It's, we've seen that even just in the, the near past. Yeah. Phoebe, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll just say quickly that for the city of South Bend, uh, the mayor, even before Mayor Pete Buttigieg, which many of you may know now, uh, he was very interested in how the city could uh, reduce its energy usage. So it started a green ribbon commission that continues to advise my office to this day. So many of them have been on that committee for over 10, almost 12 years. And that began as the municipal office of energy and they uh, Recommended, made recommendations to the city. So that was really the lifeblood at first for sustainability within the city of South Bend. And then there were global commitments made by cities across the world uh, to pick up some pieces of commitments that were in the Paris Accord. And when the US decided to withdraw for a period of time, cities um, took the lead in, in recommitting to certain goals. So that also prompted us to make a formalized plan, which as Stephen mentioned, it began with a community-wide inventory of our emissions. And that's what uh, led to those goals of energy and transportation for us in our specific plan. Great. Well, you're all doing such good work. And it's I'm, I'm just so thrilled you're all with us today because so many people can learn so much from, uh, from your example. So I, Maria touched on this a little bit, as did Evie, uh, with some of the, the groups you're working with. But how important is it? Uh, to bring stakeholders into the planning process. Uh, from a city or state perspective, do you feel you need public participation? I know sometimes uh, it's required by a statute, uh, public participation from residents in the plan development, um, from a utility or business stand standpoint, um, is there a need for customer or stakeholder input and involvement? Evie, do you wanna talk a little bit more about that uh, citizens group that you mentioned? Sure, no problem. So my answer to that question is absolutely. <laughs> a plan is only as good as the number of people that have bought into it and are aware of it and, and committed to it. We saw that a bit in our first climate action plan that was approved in 2019. It was November of 2019 and then the pandemic hit. And so the opportunity for it to really gain traction and even a lot of the input leading up to it was limited. So I still encounter folks today who didn't know we have this commitment to. So we're going about the process of updating our plan this year. And so that engagement piece is really what I'm focused on. And working with that Green Ribbon Commission that I mentioned, which is a group of 30 plus community members who have sustainability expertise. They're fantastic resources for us as we make the plan, but even potentially more important is engaging with groups that don't see these goals aligned with what they're up to and across uh, demographics from economics to race, et cetera, of trying to bring everybody into this goal. And, whether it is the environmental piece that is most important to them, whether it is the potential financial savings they can see. Um, South Bend is really committed to bringing everybody into this planning process, especially because the city, our own operations itself, according to our inventory, account for approximately 3% of our emissions. So even if we were to be perfectly in order, we still have a huge way to go in terms of reducing the emissions in South Bend communities. So we see it as mission critical to be involving people in the planning process. And, partnering with them on all these goals. By no means do we need to be the leader in executing certain parts of that plan, but instead should be following other folks' leads who have done important work on it. Excellent point about bringing in uh, the divergent uh, beliefs and attitudes as well. You know, it's you know, meet, meeting people where they're at and showing how, how it makes a difference to them, I think is so key. So it's a great point. Anybody else on this topic of uh, community or stakeholder or even investor involvement? I'll, I'll add from a utility perspective, uh, stakeholder involvement is, is critical in the planning process. Um, ultimately, we are, um, as a utility, we are serving customers and and really want to make sure we're meeting their needs and expectations. And so they're they're critical in the planning process. Um, I think as a case in point, we, we go through a, a, an integrated resource planning process on uh, for our electric utility every three years. And there are several um, public um, public forums where um, 
a range of stakeholders uh, can participate and uh, ask questions and provide input into the uh, the modeling and the planning process. Um, and just echo what what you guys said. Uh, stakeholders provide um, diverse perspectives that uh, the utility may not have already, and that can also um, can do nothing but help the planning process. And so, um, again, um, a stakeholder involvement is 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 critical. Maria Mahanth, anything to add? Sure. So uh, all of these projects I mentioned are collaborative. So um, I uh, have to work closely with the customer, de customer departments that we serve. So for example, the streets department um, who does the, the plowing of the streets and picking up the garbage and recycling, their trucks have to work. So this B100 technology, we had to work closely with the streets department as well as um, REG, which is a large producer of biodiesel and has a presence in Dane County where we are. Uh, as well as the Wisconsin Soybean Board and the National Biodiesel Board also came in with funding for this project. So we have so many stakeholders involved. Uh, with our electrification, we work closely with our utility here known as uh, Madison Gas and Electric. Um, they've helped us fund our charging infrastructure, helped, to, helped us set up charging infrastructure as well. So we have a lot of stakeholders. And then everything that we're doing here at Fleet is not in order to save the planet or prevent climate change on our own, it's to set an example for the Madison community. So we're hoping the rest of Madison community all gets vehicles or all goes into alternative fuels for their transportation. And that's why we're doing everything we're doing and we're working with a lot of external stakeholders in our community to get everyone in every house and apartment into either a bus or an electric vehicle. And I would just add that um, I would agree that the collaboration and stakeholder engagement is so is so important. Um, I've worked across five administrations uh, for the state of Wisconsin. I've now been around quite a while, um, and I've seen how different administrations approach um, working with stakeholders. And this particular administration, it's been very exciting and very. Um, uh, Governor Evers has. Um, really made sure that Wisconsin uh, residents have a voice in many of the processes. So even the, uh, we've held every, every process that we have, we've hosted listening sessions, Governor's Task Force on Climate Change. We had a number of listening sessions, um, Clean Energy Plan, we've had listening sessions. We even had a focus group related to environmental justice, um, our, you know, the budget sessions, we had listening sessions. So I think um, the, the thing about it is, is not just listening, is actually taking into consideration what is being said and incorporating that. So it's one thing to host it and listen, but it's another thing to really uh, note what people are saying, um, acknowledge the concerns or the ideas and really like follow up and reach out um, related to those ideas and concerns. And so that's really what, what a lot of the work that I've been engaged on has been built on. That's, That's a good point, Maria. Great. So the answer is overwhelmingly yes, involve as many people as possible. So I know we talked a little bit about how all of you got started, but if you could recommend it to somebody else, maybe the way you got started, you realized in, in retrospect, maybe that wasn't the best way, um, or maybe you learned from from the mistakes that, or, or the challenges that may have kind of come along the way. What would you recommend to somebody who's just getting started uh, on their decarbonization process in terms of where to begin? Is it setting goals? Is it data collection? What would you recommend? Why don't we start with you, Mahant? Yeah, sure, thank you, Laurie. That's a good question. Um, as I like to say, there's no bad time to plant a tree. Um, so whether you have a forest around you or you have no trees around you, you can plant a tree right now. And this is actually a great time to get started uh, for anyone out there who doesn't have electric vehicles yet or hasn't used um, renewable natural gas vehicles or hasn't used biodiesel. All of those things are readily available now in uh, most parts of the country. Um, so to get started, you need to do an assessment of what you have right now. Um, so we just met with a small nearby fleet for the YWCA, for example. They have eight vans and they'd like to get started. And a part of me was excited for them because it's easier to convert eight vans than it will be 1,400 vehicles for us. 
So I told her they could actually beat us to that um, if they got started. Um, so whatever the size of your inventory of your of your transportation operations, uh, start with I would say your oldest equipment um, that you're probably going to get rid of soon anyway, and focus on trying to replace those units with something more environmentally friendly. Um, as I mentioned before, with electric now you have cars, you have sedans of various kinds, SUVs, pickups, vans. Um, for a lot of what you might be trying to replace, you have good options now. And start assessing your infrastructure charging needs um, as you do that. You have to work hand in hand between the infrastructure and the types of vehicles as well. So that's sure. a get started. I know that sounds simple, but start with your oldest stuff. You're probably not gonna replace your brand new vehicles. Um, so you wanna start with older. Makes sense. Yeah. I would I would um, just chime in that um, make reasonable timelines. It's gonna take time. Like that was the biggest mistake I had. I had um, wanted to get a plan out on the streets in like three months. <laughs> and after you know assembling the you know uh, the list of people we wanted to talk to, um, you know looking at the different ideas that were out there, it just takes time. So recognize that um, what you're doing isn't going to flip the switch and solve all the problems um, to have a methodical thought out process is good and know where you're starting from i know steven mentioned this um in his comments early on is 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 sort of that baseline like where are you starting because one thing is like if you don't know where you're starting from you don't know where you're going right you need to kind of create that baseline that helps to helps to put things in perspective on like the areas that you need to focus on. You know, in transportation, there's lots of different things to look at, right? It's fuel use, how people drive their vehicles. There's also gonna be lots of different tools out there that could help you. So you wanna be able to measure yourselves along the way um, and show progress. So if you, if you wanna do that measurement and verification, you have to know where you're starting from. So modeling and investing in some of that modeling um, to kind of show that pathway forward is important. And so I would I would just recommend um, having a reasonable timeline and kind of knowing where you're starting and kind of creating that path out to where you want to go. And don't get don't get too caught up. Technology is going to change, and so you know you just want to make sure that you have a process where you can you can get things going and people. It's really clear and transparent where you're headed. Great. Anybody else? We can move on. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, one quick uh, point too, of like don't be wedded to the plan too. It might, and will likely, we were just talking about technology adopting, adapting as well too, so it will likely change too. So setting a path forward and one that holds you accountable, but also that leaves room for adjustment. So as you get other input from people that maybe you hadn't worked with before, if things are afoot that you never knew before you, Set on this plan, you can um, help support their efforts as well too, and and adjust the plan. So, starting from a point of adaptation, perhaps change will be the constant, no matter what you're working on. I think we all we all know that. Uh, so, do the projects uh, to help you achieve your goals? Do they have to be large projects with large impacts, or they can can they be smaller? Uh, things like you know, we're in the, the sustainable transportation arena. So uh, something like an anti-idling policy or energy conservation strategies versus kind of a larger project. Uh, Stephen, maybe you can weigh in on that one. Yeah, we'll, we'll do, Laurie. And it's um, kind of an ironic question for a utility because as, as you guys all know, the utilities often highlight the, the big projects, um, the uh, the coal power plant retirements, for example, the the several hundred megawatt um, renewable energy project um, but 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 no I, I not all projects need to be large and smaller projects can certainly help you achieve your company's goals and contribute to the global decarbonization effort um, smaller projects often have the um, advantage that they can be implemented more quickly um, less capital intensive and they often have um, co-benefits and uh, it's often the co-benefits I think that help build the business case for certain projects um, and so for example both um, anti-idling policies and energy conservation strategies that you mentioned Lori uh, they can save money as well as reduce greenhouse gas emissions 
Um, Anti-idling policies also have additional benefits of improved air quality. Um, so um, I think to your question, um, projects can certainly be smaller and I encourage um, folks to really look at the co-benefits for those uh, smaller projects to help build the business case. Great, great point. Anybody else on smaller projects or smaller? I would just add that every project of every size matters when you're in the times that we're in. Um, whether that's that's why we we count to the pound how many pounds of carbon dioxide we're saving, and I think every single pound matters. Um, and little easy things cities can do. So we've reduced the speed limits on some of our streets. Um, what does that mean? People have to drive a little bit slower, so everyone's saving gas that's on that road. And that that entire road is safer now, um, less likely to be collisions, injuries, fatalities on that roadway. So safety and sustainability can go hand in hand. This might seem like a small thing, but imagine over the next 10 years, if everyone reduced their speed limit by 10 miles, how much gas we would save and how many lives we might save as well. Sure. Also throw in, it's not just about the numbers, it's also about the knowledge um that um you know some of the social aspects of decarbonization plans um, are just as important as the actual um, reduction of carbon emissions so when we talk about environmental justice equity um inclusion um in our processes and um uh looking at uh emissions impacts on disadvantaged communities and the dispor disproportionate impacts on and disadvantaged communities that those are important as well. And so a lot of times um, we're starting from scratch in these communities and it's about um, education and outreach and never underestimate the value of education and outreach. Great point. Great point. Um, what are some of the cost implications for adopting uh, some of these decarbonizations, particularly for an organization with a tight budget? I know we talked a little bit about you know, some folks get excited and get on board because, you know, because of the environmental aspect. Some get excited and on board because of the economic or economic development aspects. Uh, Mahath, can you talk a little bit about total cost of ownership and return on investment uh, from a fleet perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, doing um, doing budgets in our world is uh, probably similar to a lot of other budgets. It's annual, but we really need to think about the next 15 years with everything we're doing because most of the vehicles I'm going to buy this year, we might be expected to be running them for 15 years, for example. Uh, and a lot of the facilities that we operate in, we need to think about what will the facility cost over the next 15 years. So I mentioned solar before. Uh, if we spend some extra money on solar now, as we are doing, and we're adding solar to our facilities, I'm picturing over the next 15 years a large savings in carbon dioxide and also costs when you get into let's say year four or five. Um, so a lot of our vehicles, we estimate by year four or five, the extra cost of electric will have paid for itself uh, and, the, and the charging because of the, uh, the cost of electricity being, thanks to the Public Service Commission and other regulators on utilities, you can't see a jump of 50% like we did last year on diesel and gas. Um, now with a crisis in Europe, I'm expecting fuel prices to go up even higher, entirely out of my control. I had nothing to do with what's going on in Europe, but my budget gets destroyed because of that. And it upsets me. Um, that means there's other things I can't buy with our budget next year. Um, whereas with the price of electricity, we know what is the kilowatt hour uh, price going to be? It's not gonna jump 50% because it's regulated. Um, and that's um, going out 15 years, imagine. I don't know what gas is gonna cost. In 15 years, nobody does. But I'll have a sense of what electricity is going to cost. So when you think cost of ownership, uh, think about uh, the gas you'll save, the trips to the gas station, um, and back, the um, the fluctuation, and then finally, something less known for a lot of people, but people are learning this as they drive electric vehicles. Uh, not only do they typically perform very well, maintenance we estimate less than half the cost. No oil changes. Um, no um, parts changes that you do on a typical car or truck. A lot less parts that are moving 
a lot less um, maintenance you got to do. And that's time as well as money. So um, I can't give you for every vehicle what it would be, but we're estimating overall in a 10 to 15 year vehicle by year four, we've already made back the cost, the extra cost we spent. So the return on investment is gravy from year four onwards typically. It might even be better than that as we get more data. That's great. I think it's it's one of the biggest myths too. People say we can't afford it and then they just don't even begin to look into it. And it's like, well, wait, we have to talk about total cost of ownership and return on investment. Um, I know it's one of the challenges that we at you know, both of our Clean Cities coalitions you know, work with folks on all the time. So do others want to weigh in on uh, total cost of ownership, return on investment? Okay. Yeah, hit, hit that okay. one out of the ballpark. So. <laughs> We're good. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, Stephen, I bet I know how you're going to answer this one, but um, how important is it to work with your utility when you're embarking on a decarbonization plan? That, that's a softball question, Lori. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, it's, it's very important. Um, on the uh, um, on the national level, most emissions are from transportation and the production of electricity, and so. Um, naturally, decarbonization plans often focus on these aspects, um, and uh, often um, our utilities and often um, other utilities too have uh, offers and programs that um, allow customers um, to reduce their emissions through energy efficiency, electric vehicles or charging incentives or renewable energy programs. Um, I'll highlight just a couple. Um, that we provide through our um, electric utility NITSCO. Um, we have a uh, home online marketplace where customers can save up to 75% on um, certain um, LED bulbs, thermostats, um, power strips. Uh, it's better than Amazon. Um, we also have a uh, feed-in tariff, feed tariff program that pays homes and businesses uh, to generate their own renewable electricity. Um, and then the utility will send the, the customer a check for that um, generation. And then lastly, I'll highlight a, a green power program, which um, allows customers to purchase renewable energy credits uh, to attribute um, a portion or all of their electric usage to renewable energy. Um, and so that's, um, that's an option as well. And so in summary, um, utilities often provide um, many programs and incentives to help customers uh, reduce their emissions and support a decarbonization plan. Great, lots of good, uh, lots of good programs there. Uh, did any of your organizations work with or, uh, or partner with utilities in terms of making your plans or, uh, or discussing long-term plans moving forward? Everyone's nodding. So I think gotcha. they did it, did it right. Okay, great. Well, I know that there have been, um, you know, we certainly know this with uh, Drive Clean Indiana and Wisconsin Clean Cities, uh, just a number of funding programs for decades, really, uh, to support cleaner fuels and fleets and energy savings. Uh, and we've worked uh, personally with our stakeholders on many of those types of projects, and we continue to do so. Um, we know everybody's uh, getting excited about infrastructure bill funding and has a lot of people thinking about getting into this space who haven't done it in the past. Uh, have your organizations received grant funding to assist with decarbonization goals, and how important was it to have that uh, that funding assistance? Mahanth, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, this is uh, very appropriate because Maria is here, um, and uh, Maria has been involved with the, the Wisconsin State in different capacities, including the Office of Energy Innovation. And I didn't know Maria back then, but um, we applied back in, we planned for it in 2017, 2018, we applied for a grant. At the time, we had zero electric vehicles. We wanted to get 20 very quickly, uh, and we applied for a grant for our first 20 electric vehicles by the city of Madison. I mentioned we're up to 70 now, so that was really important to get us kick-started. And, um, and uh, mentioning utilities too, uh, MG&E matched some funds as well on top of that to help us get started with that project. So, you know, it was $140,000, which is, um, significant amount uh, to offset the price of 20 electric cars and charging stations. Um, and that was one grant um, on biodiesel. Uh, we also have a very large grant going on uh, through the Wisconsin Soybean Board, the National Biodiesel Board, which has now been called, uh, renamed to Clean Fuels America Alliance. 
uh, as well as uh, REG. They've all chipped in funding for our B100 pilot. So uh, I'm sure there's a lot more money out there we could be looking for. We're looking at uh, USDA funds for uh, biodiesel tanks. Um, there's also um, DOT funding that we're looking at as a city, not just fleet, but with my uh, colleagues at Department of Transportation and Traffic Engineering and the Streets Department, we're thinking of applying for a, um, a money for like a corridor of electric charging. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there. I would highly recommend everybody take a look and apply. Sure. I know from an Indiana perspective, uh, Drive Clean Indiana has been heavily involved with assisting our members and stakeholders with uh, the Volkswagen settlement funding, um, which has been applied in a slightly different manner in Indiana than it was in Wisconsin, which is part of the program. The states kind of set their own uh, their own tone and their own uh, own ways of, of implementation. Um, and I know we've helped uh, many of our many of our members and stakeholders, uh, actually the bulk of those funds um, that have been distributed have been with our assistance in terms of grant writing and project management, um, including in the city of South Bend with some electric vehicle charging, um, some vehicles for their um, their transit system, their um, the South Bend Transpo, um, as well as um, some of your uh, businesses and industries there, there as well. So there's, you know, there's money at the local, state, federal, even nonprofits on occasion will have funding that can support your efforts. Um, you know, we would always say work with uh, work with your Clean Cities Coalition because we can be a great clearinghouse on that. So uh, moving on just a little bit, well, actually talking about that uh, that too, uh, Stephen, I know NYSource has helped with a number of projects to support decarbonization, including those in partnership with us. Can you talk uh, with Drive Clean Indiana wearing that hat now? Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the uh, some of the work we've done in partnership with each other and how that's made an impact in decarbonization, uh, in, particularly in Northwest Indiana? Sure, sure, sure. So um, as some of you know, Northwest Indiana is a um, major uh, transportation corridor. Um, the uh, um, Traffic kind of gets bottlenecked around the around Lake Michigan there a bit, and so um, any opportunities to um, reduce emissions and um, support electric uh, vehicles are are um, are helpful and 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 and, and encouraged. And so, um, yeah, thank you, Lori, for for you and your um, and Drive Clean Indiana, South Shore Clean City support of our um, electric vehicle. Uh, charging programs. There, there have been several in the past, um, which we could, which I could speak at length on. But I'll, I'll maybe just highlight the um, the near term opportunity, as you mentioned before, with the uh, VW settlement. Um, so the um, what we're what we're working on currently is a, a collaborative plan with um, other utilities to install a statewide level three DC fast charging network. Um, and that came out of the VW uh, Trust Fund, um, $5.5 million uh, to utilities to install to install 61 fast charging stations along highway corridors. Uh, Ten of those are planned for NIPSCO territory. Um, we're currently evaluating bids, and the goal is to have those stations installed by the end of next year. Um, as those stations get installed throughout the state, I think there will be additional opportunities to work with um, Drive Clean Indiana and, and other stakeholders to uh, both promote and educate cust uh, customers on electric vehicles and, and charging. Um, so again, thank thank you, Lori, for your help. Um, a lot of there's been a lot of projects, a lot of work, and uh, they I, we expect them to, to keep coming for a while. Thank you. You guys are a great partner, and uh, we're actually very fortunate. Drive Clean Indiana was selected as the um, we were the winning bidder or winning applicant for the outreach education and marketing for that statewide EV charging network that's being managed and implemented by the um, the Indiana utility groups at the state level. So that project is uh, is underway and we're we're just getting going on that this year. So we're excited about that. Um, so I know we talked a little bit about the infrastructure funding um, and there's a ton of buzz about electric vehicles and the funding. Uh, that's coming to support them. I know we've been talking about it quite a bit. Uh, Mahant, you've been talking a little bit about biodiesel. Um, Mahant, can you talk a little bit about some of the other fuels uh, and some, some of the other ways uh, that can be implemented to help decarbonize fleets in particular? 
Yeah, so um, one thing a lot of folks don't know about that I would highly recommend and we're using heavily is soybean based tires. Uh, so uh, tires typically have been made out of petroleum rubber um, and there's a new type of tire that's ba based on soybean oil, uh, which is actually supporting the local Midwest economy where a lot of soybean comes from. Uh, and we have uh, over 850 of those, mostly on police cars. And our um, police folks are very vocal about what they like and don't like, uh, and they like these tires. So that's worked out well for us. So we're happy to buy, keep buying more of those. So that's one other um, method I would recommend. And then there's hybrids. I didn't really talk much about hybrids. Uh, if you can't um, run an electric vehicle or biodiesel for whatever reason, uh, you can get a hybrid version of cars or trucks. Um, a lot of good hybrids out there. A lot of you might've heard of the Toyota Prius. That was kind of the original hybrid. And then another version called the plug-in hybrid, which is what I own personally. I have a car, uh, the Ford Fusion Energy, that I get about 23 miles on the electric motor uh, when I plug it in. Uh, and that takes care of most of my commuting needs and most of my city driving. Um, and it's not quite the same as an all electric vehicle, uh, I'd like to get a Tesla, but I can't afford one just yet. So this is my interim car until then uh, is um, a plug-in hybrid. Uh, another plug-in hybrid we really like in our fleet is the Chrysler Pacifica minivan. So you can't get a lot of vans very easily that are all electric, but the Pacifica minivan drives really well. It gets about 30 miles on the electric motor when you plug it in. Uh, and we have eight or nine of those now for the police department. They really like it. Uh, and it's also doing um, our CARES program in Madison, which is um, 911 calls that are nonviolent kind of emergencies. Instead of sending police, we're sending mental health experts uh, to these 911 calls. Uh, and this is a great program, and I'm really glad they're using a plug in hybrid for this until we can find them an all electric van. So that's kind of the range. Uh, we also have um, compressed natural gas vehicle. Uh, it's a pickup truck and CNG uh, is better than regular diesel, but it's even better when it comes from landfill methane, like the Dane County facility that has a landfill, which is basically taking all the trash we've generated for generations in this community, piled it into this landfill. You can actually get power from that. And that's very cool. And so um, we're also in the CNG game as well. Uh, so Great. those are some of the alternatives. Um, I mentioned driving slower before. Uh, if you get your drivers and your fleet all to slow down, you will crash less and you will save money and you'll save emissions. Um, your community will appreciate it. Um, that's an easy one. <laughs> sure. I know um, clean cities, we are fuel agnostic and technology agnostic and realize that not every fuel or technology works best for every, every application. So uh, we support your uh, your diversified portfolio and, and your your approach. Did anybody else want to weigh in on some of the different ways in which they're they're working on on this? I'm just going to mention one fuel that wasn't mentioned in all of Mahant because he seems to cover the whole gamut of fuels was uh, liquid propane gas. Um, and again, while compressed natural gas and liquid propane gas are fossil fuels, they do have considerably less emissions, and so as we're moving towards um, decarbonization, um, thinking about what we have access to now and the technology that we have access to now, there are a lot of um, school districts and school buses that operate on propane. And I know that the propane um, associations are looking at renewable uh, ver version of propane as well. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, as we uh, we're starting to wind down a little bit, um, let's talk about um, kind of longer term with the decarbonization plans and how you define success with your plan. Is it simply a matter of setting these short term and long term goals and looking at those numbers and collecting data? Uh, or is it more than that? Evie, why don't you start? Sure. Thanks, Lori. Um, so I would say my answer is it's a balance. We definitely want to hold ourselves accountable and find collecting that data and making it public and getting feedback on what's working and not working as an important, important part of that engagement piece. A lot of cities have made great headway on dashboards. And so it's not just a plan that sits on a shelf and people have to dig through 80 pages of a static PDF, but they're able to track. And also um, it was mentioned tracking CO2 to the pound too, and make that connection between 
taking actions that they're taking and the reduction in emissions. So we want to help tell that story through our data collection too and make that plan engaging and track success in a very public way. But we also want to, as I mentioned, don't get totally wedded to a plan. Stephen mentioned the IRP process for utilities. We as a city are paying attention to what our utilities are planning for the long term and what that means in terms of our solar uh, distributed generation goals, what it means uh, we can rely on the utility in terms of their power mix and how that can play into our carbon neutral goal. So I would say the short term is really collecting that data, making it public, using it, and also trying to find what is working really well and do more of it and where those high impact projects as well and communicating that. But then also keeping the long term in mind uh, and recognizing that a lot of it isn't in our control. We can't help, like was mentioned before, things happening in Europe and across the globe in terms of pricing. So balancing that short and long term and also what's within our capacity control at the moment. Any others? Uh, I'll add like to that. Um, go ahead. Oh, sorry. 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 Uh, it, I'll add to that. Success is, is, isn't just the environmental impact. Certainly, it's hitting those decarbonization targets. Um, but I think, as Maria mentioned earlier, uh, it's consideration of the social impacts as well. Um, for utility, that means providing safe, reliable, affordable energy for for customers, uh, rate stability. Um, positive social and economic impacts, um, both to employees and to local communities. Um, so um, uh, success is defined probably by a uh, uh, really, or could be defined by a scorecard across um, many different environmental, social and economic aspects. Absolutely. I, I know we talked a little bit about this earlier and about the importance of um, of future proofing, I don't know if we use that term, but uh, understanding that change is, change is imminent, it's going to happen. Is there a way to work into your plan? Um, you know, something that, that allows it to be future proof and to, to be fluid and to be transparently fluid? Yeah, I think um, Phoebe mentioned the, um, like not putting it, like not having a plan that is just getting dusty on a shelf. What you want is a plan where you measure and verify and you have accountability, right? Um, it also needs to speak to different audiences, right? I think the was brought up earlier about, you know, people have different values and, and some people um, don't want to talk about climate change. They rather talk about like the economy and and finances and their business and you know what like you need to understand where people are coming from and so i think if you build a plan that speaks to and has the flexibility to speak to a large audience you'll get more buy-in and then the other part is that um it also speaks to technology changes along the way and behavioral changes along the way like people aren't like i use my husband as an example all the time like i like am in i'm try to get him to switch over to alternative fuels. I finally got him to do that and he bought, a, you know, a hybrid Tahoe. Um, so, you know, we're on our way, but like that's not an electric vehicle. Um, we have to change the way that we're driving. We have to like, there's, there's like people might not quite be ready. And so over time, that's going to change again with education, with more technology deployment. Um, fleets are just like a really great uh, way to get technology out there and show and demonstrate that this really works. Um, it's just, it's just, you start with the police. And so I think um, Clean Cities is just a great resource because you're, you're, the Clean Cities coalitions are in the know on technology and what's happening and where's the funding and, and how can we plan. So I think just having the resources to be able to move along the way uh, really will ensure that you'll have that success in long term and just being flexible. Some things are going to work and some things aren't. Um, and just having that flexibility and saying, okay, well, that didn't work. Let's let's figure out what will work. I think that's great. Anybody else? Uh, have... It's all over the place, but... <laughs> no, I think that was perfect. Anybody else have ideas on how to help future-proof your plan? Uh, yes, yeah, something we're doing in Madison is... Um, we are very public about our goals. Um, so I mentioned our 2030 goal, all biodiesel or all electric. Um, I say it publicly in all these kind of forums that I'm in uh, or travels that I'm in and um, in the meetings uh, we do internally because we really have to start now. I was just noticing the date. It's 222022. Um, 
it, 2030 might seem like a far way off, it's really not. When we look at the life cycles of our equipment that we have to maintain, like I said, for 10 to 15 vehicles, that means what we're buying now, if possible, needs to be uh, a part of that goal. And uh, you know, just today we were working on an electric uh, large ch wood chipper, uh, which should be very cool. And we recently had a conversation with MG&E about it and uh, we negotiated the cost and I think we got a good power price for it. Um, ultimately, we make a plan and then we work the plan every day. And every day I'm very aggressive with my staff and my colleagues about what we're bringing in the door right now. And I'm recently rejecting requests from the police department for various, they want um, larger gas SUVs for canine units. I said, no. And my attitude is make me, you know, make me say yes to this and no one is, uh, no one's gonna fight it. Uh, but someone has to put their foot down. Someone's gotta be kind of the jerk on these plans and I'm happy to be that jerk. It's the only way it's gonna get done. If you just say, oh, we'll let this gas vehicle through or that one, everyone's gonna notice and it'll never get done. So you have to kind of not just make a plan, but stick to it, put your foot down. Um, and eventually it'll start moving itself and the training will leave, a, leave the station. It took me several years to get here and a lot of debate, uh, but it's finally to the point where no one's fighting it anymore. I would flip that on its head and say, make you the cheerleader. Somebody has to be the cheerleader. <laughs> I don't know that That's anybody would ever call you a jerk, but I think I think you're an advocate for uh, <laughs> for for your program. <laughs> so, well, folks, we are winding down, and we're right at time. I just want to let attendees know this is being recorded. Um, we're going to keep going just a little bit longer, uh, so you won't miss anything. You can always uh, get to the end of that recording and check uh, to see you know what was here at the very end. So, uh, briefly, as we as we do wrap up the last question for the panel is what would you say to the attendees if they're interested in starting and they just don't know where to go or where to start go to clean cities go to the clean cities coalition they're your they're a great resource thank you thanks maria and everybody's nodding you guys are great thank you so much <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, of course uh, well, I want to thank all of our speakers, not only for being with us today, but for all they're doing um, to make sure that our future is happier, healthier, cleaner, and more sustainable. You know, the uh, the air doesn't quite understand jurisdictions, right? Nature doesn't really understand those jurisdictional boundaries. So this is making a difference for all of us, and uh, I think we should, you know, applaud and be thankful for all of the work that all of you do that you're all doing, uh, and really for everything you're doing to support the Clean Cities mission. So thank you all so very much. Appreciate having you with us today. Um, unfortunately, we only had just a couple uh, questions and we're not gonna be able to get to them, but that last slide, you don't have to go back, uh, but that last slide did have the email addresses for all of our speakers, and that will be included in an email to all of our attendees as well. So you can uh, feel free to contact our speakers at any time. And I'm sure that they would be happy to answer your questions as would we. Uh, at uh, Drive Clean Indiana and Wisconsin Clean Cities. Uh, coming up, we have some other exciting things coming up. Uh, our next and final installment in the winter webinar series is the Celebrating Women in Sustainable Transportation webinar that's coming up on the 24th of March from 10 to 11. Uh, registration's open for that on both the Drive Clean Indiana and the Wisconsin Clean Cities uh, websites, which you see there. Uh, Drive Clean Indiana has a great event coming up on March 9th. This is in conjunction with Work Truck Week in Indianapolis. Uh, this is a municipal fleet networking reception. So this is for municipal fleet managers and elected officials. Not every community has somebody who is technically uh, identified as a fleet manager. Uh, if you are a budget decision maker on fleets, we'd like to see you there. Um, this is going to be hosted at Best Equipment Company, one of our members, and it is co-sponsored by Ingevity, McAllister Transportation, and Ozinga Energy. Uh, we will take you in propane school buses to and from the Work Truck Week location, actually the Marriott right across the street. Um, and we'll talk to you a little bit there about some of the funding opportunities. We'll have some demo vehicles on display and uh, some uh, cocktails and hors d'oeuvres for you to network with and enjoy as well. And we'll get you back safely uh, to the um, convention hall in those propane buses. Uh, we also, uh, Mahanth knows about this very well. Uh, this is a good example of where Mahanth is a wonderful cheerleader is also for this event. Uh, the Transportation and Innovation Expo. This is being co-hosted in uh, Madison by the City of Madison 
Wisconsin Clean Cities, Alliant Energy, and Madison Gas and Electric. This is a huge transportation and innovation expo there. Uh, our event in 2019 had uh, over 300 attendees in this massive expo hall. Uh, wonderful breakout sessions from industry experts, latest on transportation technologies. Um, we have this huge expo hall with sustainable vehicles and pieces of equipment indoors, as well as a ride and drive outdoors. Um, this year we're going to be having a networking reception the evening before, which is included in registration, in that expo hall to give people a little more time to network and see that space. Uh, registration open on Wisconsin Clean Cities website and there are also sponsorship and exhibitor opportunities there and you can bring your vehicles and equipment so contact us for that and one last pitch uh, the annual surveys for both Wisconsin Clean Cities and Drive Clean Indiana are due March 4th this is how we help um, DOE to uh, quantify greenhouse gas emissions um, in the states and across the country. Um, this information also helps uh, with us with making some decisions about which ones of our members and partners have made the greatest greenhouse gas emission reductions and lead to the um, awards that we give at our events every year. Um, you do not need to be a member of either of our coalitions to submit a survey and participate. Um, we would love for you to do so. If you have any questions about this at all, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to help you with it. Um, the surveys are available under the About Us tabs on both of our websites. Next slide, please. And thank you all again for attending. A very special thank you to all of our panelists, to Evie Bauman, Stephen Holcomb, Mahanth Joyshi and Maria Redman for your time and to all of you for attending today. Please feel free to reach out to any of us uh, on your panel and either of our coalitions. We'd be more than happy to help you and to continue the conversation. We hope to see you at our next event. Thank you again. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.